Open up your heart and rejoice before Him, for the King is your God. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion, for the Lord has delivered thee. Arise and sing, ye children of Zion, for the Lord has delivered thee. Oh, come on, church, hallelujah! Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him, for the King is your... Open up your heart! Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him, for the King. Come on, Horn Section, praise Him tonight. this evening with a Holy Ghost expectation there's a spirit born anticipation in your heart that inevitably you're going to touch God this evening I'm reminded of a scripture has been rolling in my heart as soon as I walked in and it says thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power tonight we've just stepped into the day of the Lord's power he's ruling and he's reigning are you willing to make a deposit, to make an investment in the earlier part of this service, to touch heaven and see God do something to you that will literally turn the tide of your situation? How many are going to set your faith loose and touch heaven? Let's lift our hearts to Jesus, shall we? And with humility of spirit and, and a, a need for God, let's begin to worship Him. Lift your hands to heaven and praise Him. Hallelujah. Give Him your implicit trust tonight and let's depend on the raw naked power of God and let's see Jesus confirm His word. Hallelujah. Lord, to your throne we lift up praises. Oh, we lift up our worship. We give unto you the measure of our faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Oh, Rasama! Hallelujah! Lift your hands to heaven, sing the great chorus. Let's honor God. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. My God. Hallelujah, Lamb upon the cross, we worship and adore you, we made your glory known. Hallelujah, glory to the King, you're more than a conqueror, 
You're the God of everything. Hallelujah. Lamb upon the throne. We worship and adore you. You made your glory known. Hallelujah. Glory to the King. You're more than a conqueror. You're the Lord of everything. Hallelujah. Lamb upon the throne. We worship and adore you. You made your glory known. Hallelujah. Glory. You're more than a conqueror. You're the Lord of everything. Come on, everybody, sing it with your hearts. Hallelujah. Lamb upon the throne. We worship and adore you. Made your glory known. Hallelujah. You're more than a conqueror. You're the Lord of everything. Hallelujah, Lamb upon the throne, we worship and adore you, you made your glory known. Hallelujah, here we go, you're more than a time. Let's sing it again. Come on, there's a breath of God in this house. One more time. Ha, here we go. You're the Lord. Before you're seated, go ahead and tell hello to Lucifer. Just let him know you know where he is. <laughs> Glory! Woo! Well, look a look -a. How many believe God's on the throne? When people come and hand you money and say, Preacher, build a bigger building for a greater harvest. Amen. Blessed interruptions. Go ahead and intrude upon me. Amen. Somebody turn to somebody else and tell them it's God. I like this. One hundred dollars, one hundred dollars. Come on over here, Sonny. Stand here. Help me collect the money. Woo. How many believe God's in this, folks? Diamond rings and gold and somebody shout a little bit. Woo! Well! He 
say, what, what's, he, what's he doing? He's in training. Hallelujah. Well, come on over here and give me that offering. Put it in there, brother. Amen. Lift it up to God right now. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank God for people that can move by the high impulse of the Holy Ghost. They need no prodding by man. But in their sensitivity, they hear and are ruled by the voice of God. And so bless this and multiply it a hundredfold. Let it be a seed offering, Lord. As you've mandated this church to arise and build, we look forward to the mighty harvest time anointing that you are pouring out in this day. A revival, God, of signs and wonders and miracles that will draw the hearts of men and women everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a standing ovation. God bless you, Sonny. Come on over here. You came to give God something. God gave you something last night. Tell the folks, let's just glorify Jesus. For the past few months, that Satan has really been attacking me. Uh, I just felt like I couldn't take it any longer. And as much as I tried to praise God, I kept feeling like something was going to happen. Well, it's not going to happen anymore. Hallelujah. What happened to you last night? I felt like I was going to have a nervous breakdown. And uh, Brother Clark called me out by name. And he laid hands on me. And I know that God is with me always. Somebody shout a little bit. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you, my sister. take a hold of this how many this evening let me see by an uplifted hand you have been touched miraculous you've been healed in your body as a result of these crusades look at here how many still have the miracle wave to Jesus amen let's give the Lord another standing ovation
this place, there's a God that can meet the need. You don't have to wrestle with the reluctance of Jesus Christ. God has no reluctance in His Spirit. He wants to meet you more than you feel you need to be met. He just requires a faith toward heaven. Now tonight I'm asking the ushers to come forward. Let's move into the service and let's give as unto the Lord. I don't have to explain to you about giving. What you saw here was a wave of giving that began about three, four months ago as people began to hear from God supernaturally that we were to build an extended edifice on this piece of property to prepare for the harvest that's about to come in the East Coast. God has spoken to us that God is going to visit America through the eastern gate of the city. Now in 1904, God's visitation flowed from the west to the east, but He's coming in our generation through the eastern gate. We're expecting great things. If you have your offering, lift it to heaven. Father, bless your people. Bless their hearts, bless their bodies, bless their lives. And as they invest and sow seed, I pray a hundredfold harvest in the form of their need be returned unto them. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Sister Tree, come on, and I want you to sing your song. And everybody shout amen. 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 God bless you. you
tonight. He needs no introduction here in Upper Room. Welcome the evangelist Freddie Clark as he comes to you. And it's a happy privilege to be back with you here on Friday night at Upper Room. And I feel like we've gone to the Upper Room already. <laughs> We're going to try to do one song tonight. I don't see how in the world a man can sing after what we just heard. But the Holy Ghost is the preacher, so the Holy Ghost must be the singer. Besides, we have several requests to do this song, and especially now that we're going into another building program. Amen. I also understand that some of you folks may recognize this song. I would like to mention In Short Beyond the Grave. That's an insurance policy that won't cost you much. And it'll last for a long, long time. And if you have real estate troubles, we have Little House on Hallelujah Street. <laughs> Album number two. And you're just sick and tired of paying these tolls between here and Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Staten Island. I see a bridge. For a $6 offer, you can have your own bridge. Our latest album is Till the Lands with two winning hands. And they do a little farming out here on Long Island. And we may do some plowing the field tonight. The winter storms are almost past. That is because storms never last. Do they say to It is that last song on the second side of this last album mentioned that we're going to try to do tonight for a special number on the guitar because, well, the real building is your body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you don't work on it, I know a God who will. Incidentally, those albums will be available after church tonight in the vestibule by whoever's in charge of the tape ministry. a sinner I want everybody in Long Island, New York to know what I'm gonna do And get to working on a building too. Working on a building, working on a building, working on a building for my Lord, for the Lord. Working on a building too, cause I'm working on a building. Working on the building. Working on a building for my Lord, for my Lord. If I was lukewarm, tell you what I'd do. I would catch on fire. 
catch on working on a building too Cause I'm working on a building Working on a building, thank God Working on a building For my Lord, for my Lord Working on a building too, cause I'm working on a building. Working on a building, thank God. Working on a building, for my Lord, for my Lord. If I was a drunkard, tell you what I do. I'd quit guzzling whiskey, get to working on a building too, cause I'm working on a building. Working on a building, thank God. Working on a building. For my Lord, for my Lord. If I was a cusser, tell you what I'd do. I'd stop cursing and swearing and get on to working on a building too. Cause I'm working on a building, working on a building, working on a building. For my Lord, for my Lord. What I do, I quit puffing marijuana, get to working on the building. Do I want to work on the building? Working on the building, working on the building, my Lord, for my Lord. If I was a snuffer, tell you what I do. I quit chewing and spewing and get on to working on the building too, because I'm working on the building. The hand doing, get on to working on a building too. Cause I'm working on a building, working on a building, Tell you what I do. I would park that chewing gum, get to working on the building too. Cause I'm working on a building. Working on a building. Working on a building. For my Lord, for my Lord. Well, if I. Was a deacon, I tell you what I do. Keep on digging and keep on working on a building too Cause I'm working on a building Just gonna do. I will keep on preaching, keep on working on a building too. It's a Holy Ghost building. Said if I was a preacher, and I am, and I'll tell you what this preacher's gonna do. I will keep on preaching, keep on working on a building too. Cause I'm working on a building.
hands a little bit higher and let's praise him for 30 seconds. All oh, changing and transitioning from one level of this meeting to another, from one order of this service to another. We praise God in the transition. Hallelujah to God. Wonderful Jesus is his name. Glory to God in the highest. Honor, peace, goodwill toward men. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise ye the Lord. Let us praise him. Glory be to God. I love him. Because he first loved me. Glory to God. Are you glad you're in church? Are you working on the building? Punch the clock and show up for work. God's not fussy who he uses. You'll get out of the meeting what you put into it, and he'll never be in debt to you. So whatever you're worth tonight, that's what you're going to get. If you're not worth anything, you won't get anything. So let's get to work and be worth something. Thank God for efforts made. We shall be rewarded. Thank the Lord. I want you to just turn around and shake one hand. I just get the old pump by the pump handle and pump the well real good. And tell them Jesus still lives and still lives on Long Island. Still lives on Long Island. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. After that, you may be seated. Praise God. I had a special guest that flew in today from Lafayette, Louisiana. His name is Brother Tommy Tenney. He pastors down there. And he came up especially to be in this meeting. I do believe he's probably uh, the fellow that's fathers from home in this meeting tonight. And I want you to make him welcome. He's going to come down here and say hello and give you a short word and uh, bless your heart. And I think anyone comes that far, we ought to find out who he is. Brother Tommy Tenney. I might be far away from home, but I feel right at home. My daddy's here. Yeah. Hallelujah. I feel to tell you that for those of you who wonder what's going on and you feel like warfare has been declared, it has. But the difference is I've read the back of the book and I know which team wins. And that's the one I'm playing for. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, we've got to keep swinging and keep fighting. We're living in what I like to call, we're living between the times. It's kind of like when D-Day happened and the Allies invaded Europe. That broke Hitler's back. The war wasn't over that day. But historians look back in retrospect and they say from that day on it might as well have been over because the outcome had been decided. But those soldiers down in the trenches, if you'd gone down to tell them, hey buddy, the war's over, they're going to say, no sir, it's not. The bullets are still flying. My heart's still beating and I have a little wonder what's going to happen. But looking back on it, we know that the outcome was decided on that day. For about a nickel, I might. <laughs> but it wasn't until 11 months and a lot of long, hard days later that V-Day came. D-Day was when the outcome was decided. V-Day was when the outcome was finalized. Let me just leave this with you. About 2,000 years ago, He climbed a hill called Calvary And Jesus Christ established a beachhead In this world He brought a little bit of heaven down here And just like you've seen the statue of him planting the flag He planted a flag It was called a cross And it said I came to stay And blood was shed and battles have been fought but the outcome has been forever and eternally decided because he won on that day. We're going to win from here on out. We might lose a war every now and then, 
Uh, we might lose a battle every now and then, but we're going to win the war. I might fall down, but I am going to get back up. Hallelujah. Victory has already been decided. In the meantime, don't give up hope. Your outcome has been settled by what took place 2,000 years ago. And all we have to do is hang in there and keep fighting. And as long as we fight, we're on the winning team. From Lafayette, Louisiana, Reverend Tommy Kenny. Did you enjoy those good words tonight? We're going to give you a text and see what happens from there. We may only get to preach in between the miracles, but then again, God can only confirm His Word. Time, Life, Newsweek Magazine, and the New York Post are out of the question. God cannot confirm them, but what we're about to read right now, He can confirm. Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 29. Let's read verse 17. Leah was tender-eyed, but Rachel was beautiful and well-favored. Hmm. Jump over to verse 31. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Ah, comes an interesting portion now. The six sons of Leah. And Leah conceived and bare a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. And she conceived again in Baristan and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. And she conceived again in Baristan and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me, because I have borne him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi. And she conceived again in Baristan and she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. In the next chapter 30, are a couple of verses, verse 17, God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my husband, and she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endowed me with a good dowry, now will my husband dwell with me because I have borne him six sons and she called his name Zebulun. To balance this in the New Testament, there's one verse. I'll turn to it for you. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 46. Trust me, it's there. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. Lord, I thank you for the reading of this word tonight. Let this revelation from God be profound. Let it explode in upon the consciousness of all the hungry listeners. And let your word of God tonight be a two-edged sword that pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit in joints and marrow. And let it be a discerner of thoughts and intents of every heart. I praise you for answers that are arriving by the moment and for the miraculous that shall follow in its confirmation. And everyone said amen. amen. Just for a little bit tonight, I have this particular uh, message and substance and portion to deliver by the Spirit entitled, The Deceit of the Dark Tent. How many has ever had a dark spot in your life? How many has ever been discouraged? Wow, look at all the people that's never been discouraged. Looks like I better ask you what your secret is. How much have ever been through a trauma? A trial. A temptation. A hard place. A difficult time. A place where you were going through the dark valley, the shadow of death. Yet you feared no evil because you was yoked to Christ. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I found it so. That which is first is natural. That which is second is spiritual. I'm the first half of that yoke, but he's the second half of that yoke. There's lots of times I don't even know where I'm going, but 
Since I'm yoked, he pulls me on through. I don't have to figure out my course because I'm attached to him. Hallelujah. There's a lot of times I can't carry myself, let alone my own load. But since I'm yoked, and he's in the other side of the yoke, he keeps dragging me along, me and my burden too. Oh, how can two walk together save they be agreed? Be not unequally yoked together. What fellowship have light with darkness? What concord have Christ with Belial tonight? Oh, let's get unified in unison and be part of it. If you will just put your neck in his noose, you'll find his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I have found it so. Come on to me, all you little weary and heavy laden. And I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, there is such a thing as God breaking the yoke, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Those are only yokes of affliction and disease and sin and bondage. When it comes to being joined to the Lord, they that are joined unto the Lord are one spirit. Thy maker is thy husband, O church. And though we have a widowed mentality in the church today where people have starvation, two by four thinking, woe is me. My husband is dead and my schedule has changed. My income is gone. My world is upside down. How will I ever cope with this new agenda? Got news for you. The church is no widow. Quit thinking like one. The church isn't even married yet. Come on, bride-to-be that is a spouse. Say hallelujah. You're engaged. And when you finally do get married at the marriage supper table of the land, that'll make these $100 plate presidential campaign dinners look like a hot dog roast. <laughs> you will be married forever. Strikes me you can't be a widow unless you're married, and then your husband's going to die. But since he ever liveth to make intercession for you and I, and all the increase of his kingdom and government, there shall be no end. He cannot ever die again. He's tasted death once and for all, and that's it. You may taste it once and for all, and that'll be it for you too. It's appointed on the man wants to die, but after death, the judgment. Oh, thank God. So let us not think like the widows in the uh, Old Testament, like the one that came to Elijah and said, My servant, my husband is dead, oh, what will I ever do? And then the widows in the early apostolic church who murmured and complained because they were neglected in the daily ministration. There's a ministry of the Spirit every day, that's true. And if you're neglected, it's your own fault. It's here. Sit up to the table. They were not vegetables. They were not in wheelchairs and stretchers and under iron lungs and sleeping beneath oxygen tents. They were merely widows. They knew how to wait on tables and wash dishes and take care of husbands. At least they know how to feed themselves. How many knows how to feed yourself tonight? Let's sit up to the table. Oh, let's get uh, ready for something great. Yeah, I I'm yoked. How many's yoked? Now, there's a yoke that you must carry and a cross you must bear. But if the yoke is bondage, it can be broken tonight. It was true in the life of this uh, man, Jacob, that his father, Isaac, went blind in his old age. Didn't have to go blind, but... Isaac was determined to bless the reprobate. Something that's impossible to do. No matter how you try, you can't bless the reprobate. Oh my. Conscience seared of a hot iron. Esau, who had sold out for a mess. A mess of pottage, so quit messing around. Wondering why the preacher bends his ear. He still listens for a response. Amen, oh me, or oh my, one of them will fix you. Microphone is still portable. We can come down and pick out the quiet spot this Friday night and preach if necessary. No cord on the microphone, which means nobody in the building can escape us this evening. What a pleasant thought. Jacob, in a sheepskin, deceiving his father. What a liar and a cheat, Mr. Planner. But at least he wasn't as bad as a reprobate. I said, if there's still hope for you tonight, well... God will move on your behalf. If you're here, let's hope for you. If you were too far gone, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't be here. You couldn't cry. You wouldn't be concerned. But you're in the right place at the right time. And why should anybody be blinded in their old age because they refuse to do the will of God and want to do their own will? 
Why should anybody be afflicted in this hour, in this meeting, because you think your will is more important than God's? Fall upon the stone and be broken, and woe unto the man upon whom the rock shall fall, for it will grind him to powder. So when Esau finally came in, Father, bless me. I have no blessings left. Oh, glory. I serve a father that has plenty of blessings left. He that keep of Israel doth neither slumber nor sleep. He never gets tired, so he don't have to sleep. I get tired of praying for people night after night, but he never gets tired of healing them. Hallelujah. And here comes Esau with no blessing, and of course he chases his brother, wants to kill his brother, but then again it was Esau that sold out. So he sought a place of repentance diligently with bitter tears. He found none. However, Jacob escaped and went to the land of the children of the east, and we find him in the opening of chapter 29, looking at a brand new scene, a big green field of meadow, a hay field. In the midst of the field, in the middle was a well. On the well was a stone laying on the well's mouth. Interesting, said Jacob. And what's this? Three flocks of sheep laying around the well with their shepherds staring at each other. The sun is high in the sky, said Jacob to his newfound strangers that should have been his friends. Why don't you water these sheep? I see dry hay hanging on their whiskers. Hello. How many came for a drink tonight? You're at the filling station. You've showed up at the watering hole. Did you know you can only eat so much until you have a drink? We've got too many folks now trying to choke down parched, legalistic material. The Spirit and the Word agree to set people free. Now the food is the Word of God, but the drink is the Spirit of God. Now unless you get a good soaking tonight and reach the saturation point, you might choke down a few of these things we're preaching. I know there's a stone on the well's mouth, but it strikes me we ought to get it off and give these sheep a drink. Amen. How many could stand a drink tonight? Amen. Oh, <laughs> out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. <laughs> Scripture talked about there springs up within you a well of living water, springing up unto life eternal, told the woman at the well. All through the scripture talks about this well of water, this water being the Spirit of God giving you life, and you cannot eat no more till you get a drink. What I really said was, if all you have is word, you're going to dry up. And if all you have is spirit, you're going to blow up. But if you could get yourself the right mixture between the spirit and the word, you would grow up. You want to grow up tonight? Get the dry hay off your mustache and take a big drink. We're about to shove a stone off the well's mouth. I suppose you want to know where the well's mouth is. First of all, find the well. Out of your innermost being, out of your belly, shall flow it. And, and it's not far above the well that you find the well's mouth. With too many weights hanging on it. Too many plugs plugging it. Why don't you pull the plug tonight and get your mouth open and, and, and start praising God and worshiping Him until you come into His presence with thanksgiving. Walk into His courts with praise. Let us tie the sin and the weight that doesn't easily be set here. Run of patience the weights that set before you. Now we can get all these weights off. Just roll that stone away. Did Jesus have the stone rolled away on resurrection morning? What did He roll it away for? Was it to get out? He had a glorified body. He could go through anything. He didn't need that stone to move so he could get out of the grave. He moved it so you could get in. Oh, do you want to get in on this great resurrection food here tonight? Praise God. It's you that has a problem entering into the things that God has in store for you. And you'll have much of a problem entering in when you got too many weights on you. Nobody wins a race all weighted down. It's down for the race. So the stone is rolled away to let us in. Now Peter and John came huffing and puffing to the tomb. John got there first. Peter got there last. But John did not enter in first. Peter, who got there last, entered in first. 
So what that means is it doesn't matter when you get here to the meeting, just make sure that you enter in once you get here. Amen. And there's no reason why you can't enter in the stones out of your way. Ooh, let's dive in head first, jump in the pool where the waters are troubled. Thank God. With whom swear he that cannot enter into his rest, was it not with those who believe not, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? We see they cannot enter in because of unbelief. Do you want to enter in tonight? Yes, sir. So he looks over the scene. What a scene it was in the land of the children of the East. Anybody know any of those children of the East? Well, if you don't, move a little bit farther out on Long Island in an easterly direction. But you are in the eastern portion of this country and you are children of the east and the only reason that sheep are laying around by the flock with dry hay on their whiskers is because somebody won't move the stone off the well's mouth so they can have a drink. You get some of these weights off and you, your mouth will open, you'll praise God and the water will flow and you'll be saturated. You'll get a drink and then you can eat some more. Eat some more of the word of God that is being uh, cast upon the waters. It's bread tonight. Man cannot live but bread alone. But for every word that proceedeth out of the mouth, the mouth of God. So Jacob looks all around and says, why don't you feed these, uh, water these sheep? He says, oh, we couldn't do that. Well, why not? If the sun is high in the sky, it's yet in the middle of the day. These sheep could be eating. They could be gaining weight. They could be putting on maturity development and growth and if you just give them a drink they could be out of the way and make room for the next flocks of sheep well we can't touch the whale until all the shepherds show up and all the flocks are gathered and there as a basic unit we all step forward together and take the stone off the whale's mouth jointly in a communistic fashion we can't have any of this personal attainment. None of this whosoever will let it come. Nobody excelling now. We don't want to rock the boat and let no one get ahead of no one else here. We are waiting for a union meeting. Well, if you're waiting for all the churches and preachers on Long Island to get together, you'll be waiting the doomsday. Because it's not going to happen. Some inspiration's got to start moving up the road pretty soon and mighty fast. And all of a sudden it stuck and here it came and someone said, oh, here comes Rachel, daughter of Laban, and she's got her father's sheep. Woo! Let me take a look at that woman, said Jacob. He said, wowie, hot diggity dog. <laughs> That's the woman for me. The bride-to-be is such an inspiration. Blow my hat in the creek. I can hardly stand it. Maybe the rest of you sheep don't want nothing. Maybe you shepherds don't care if you do anything till all the shepherds show up to do it in an organized fashion. But there's a bride to be coming up the road. Oh, it's coming. Hallelujah. The ark is coming up the road. Oh, David thinks with all his might the ark was coming up the road. His wife despised. Him in a heart, but the ark was still coming up the road. All sing on, shout on, we're gaining ground on the ark's coming up the road. The mighty, mighty power of God's are coming down, the ark's still coming up the road. He said, well, can you, a man, I never saw the beat, never saw such a thing, said he. That woman inspires me. And he went dashing to the well, and he grabbed the stone all by his lonesome. So, Anointed and inspired, he cast the stone off the well's mouth. But you ought to talk about sheep headed for the well. I said, talk about sheep heading for a well. They saw that stone move. Brother, they all got in there and just stuck their nose in it. They all began to drink and to uh, slurp up the goodness. All because the bride-to-be had inspired Jacob. I believe the church ought to be an inspiration. I don't believe the church ought to be a long face, mule face drag. Why, if somebody sees your mule face religion across the street, they'll run to the other side of the street. They'll think it's contagious. <laughs> if you don't feel you, it's not going to feel nobody else. You enjoying yourself tonight? Well, then others will come in to enjoy. But they don't want any more bondages. No more religion. 
No more oppressions and uh, rituals and forms and ceremonies and burdens and weights. They're already carrying more than they can carry. Right. Isn't it true? Uh-huh. And so now, the sheep were drinking. And while they all drank, rest of the show, they didn't care whose flock was whose when that stone got off the well's mouth. Nobody really cared. There's water available. Brother, when they find out Jesus is at your church, they'll be here. They may have to go back and go through the motions at their own church, but uh, when they're wanting something real, they'll be back. When they're thirsty, they'll return. Hallelujah. When they get sick again, they know where to come back to. Are you listening to me? Oh, hallelujah. He got so inspired by the church. Well, Rachel was the bride-to-be. Come on, bride-to-be. You're not married yet. You're just a bride-to-be. He ran up and smacked one on her. Smack all. Bible said, Jacob kissed Rachel. Laban came running out of his tent. He didn't get furious. He just took one look and said, oh, this is God. He said, boy, you're a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Jacob says, that sounds good enough to me. I worked seven years for that girl. Consider it done, said Laban. Go ahead and work seven years. You, he, she might just well marry you, because if she don't, she'll just go off and marry somebody else. Isn't that the truth? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and so he works for seven years. And it seems like seven minutes, seven hours, seven days. Or it didn't seem like no time at all. Why, so the scripture didn't it seem like but a very brief time for him to be because of his love for her. Why don't you fall in love with Jesus again? Come on, you Ephesian church that's left your first love. Repent and do your first works, which includes getting back your first love. And when you start loving Jesus again like you used to, it won't seem no time at all that you're waiting for the trumpet to sound. Hallelujah! You won't endure you won't suffer. You won't murmur. You won't complain. You don't care what the burden is or the price that is to be paid. It requires you do whatever he asks of you because you love him. I'm talking about the kind of love Jacob had for Rachel. that makes seven years seem like no time at all. Are you listening? Well, finally, the great day arrived. It was the wedding night. And of course, every bride dreams about the wedding night. Every bride-to-be and every bridegroom the same way. And tonight was that great final consummation of the seven years of toil and labor upon the earth. There was going to be an enrapturous marriage. How many can hardly wait for yours? I'm talking about the one that's in glory. Well, on the wedding night, Jacob was so excited. It was a night that was a strange, strange night. Because the night was very, very dark. There was no sun, moon, or stars. Of course, there wouldn't be any sun. But there was no moon or stars. And it was one of those pitch black nights where you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. Anybody ever been in such darkness as that? Well, oh, darkness has covered the earth and gross darkness to people. You ever woke up in a dark room and said, well, I'll get my eyes open in a minute and come to find out you felt and it was already open. It was that dark. Hey, Amen. That's the miracle, to open your eyes and know you're in the darkness. That's the miracle. Most people are in darkness and don't know, but you get your eyes open, you, then you know you're in the darkness. You're making progress. Oh, let the light so shine. His word of light to my path, lamp to my feet. Well, it was a dark, dark night in Jacob's wedding tent. It was called the deceit of the dark tent. Hello. How many knows what I'm going to say next? Oh, what a feeling it was. He had confidence. He had faith. He just knew that everything was going to be like he had it planned. He had it mapped out, memorized, figured out for seven years in his head. 
Oh, what a plan and a project it was. Finally, unbeknownst to him, as he begins to assume, and he begins to presume, and begins to take for granted, and to take by faith an element of the unknown. Lo and behold, it's the night that Jacob has learned to trust. He did not have the slightest inkling anything could go wrong with his plans. Why, nothing could hinder his love. Why, everything was going according to schedule. He had it sent straight out to the nth degree. But the night was so dark. And that night, Laban, his father-in-law, slipped one over on him. Hello. I said that night he leads to the tent a uh, daughter whose name is Leah, the older sister of Rachel. Oh my goodness. And Jacob doesn't know the difference. It's so dark in the tent. He thinks it's Rachel. What a wonderful time it was and very cruelly the light would soon spring. I said it would dawn on him when the sun came out. One fella stayed up all night long wondering where the sun went to. And in the morning it dawned on him. I said revelation's going to break through. Light's going to spring in. Suddenly you're going to see something you never saw before. He had learned to trust. He was learning to trust. Oh, isn't it amazing how God takes over where you leave off. And your opportunity is his opportunity. And your old stumbling stone is his stepping stone. And you wouldn't have done that thing for all the tea in China. And yet it happened to you. How did... God ever do this to me? How did this ever happen? I had such carefully laid plans. My future was so promising. I had everything all figured out how I could live life. I had it all down to a science. And this had to happen to me. How could God be so cruel? You're learning to trust. Did you know as long as you're controlling your life, God can never give you the best in your life? Because your brain's too small. Your insight's too limited. Spiritually speaking, most folks can't see their hand in front of their face. They can't see the forest for the tree. It has to come a time in your career that God takes you out of control so that He can really do something with you. Of course, you wouldn't do it that way, but isn't it amazing how everybody we know has perfect 2020 hindsight? When it all comes out in the wash, you say, yeah, I saw God in that. God was your matter. I wouldn't have done it for all the world. That's not my style. That's not my way. If I'd had anything to say, don't you know I'd put my foot down, but I was out of control. I had no partner lot of choice in the matter. One day you're going to lay on your back in a hospital and look out by the doctor with a mask over his face so that you can't tell who did it to you. And you're going to be now, man, paralyzed from your head down to your toe. Down comes this big knife. You're learning to trust. I said, you learn to trust one day. One day, Jesus dismissed his own spirit on the cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I trust God of my soul. Most people can't even trust God of their body, let alone their soul. Hello. Your body's here to trust him with just for practice run. One day you're going to be loose from your bars of bone. You're going to leave this old carcass. And will you trust God to take your spirit to the right place? Will you gravitate to the right spiritual level? Hallelujah. Learning to trust. You'd have never done things the way that it happened to Jacob. And the way that things have happened in your life has really devastated some people. 
Some people think they're just ruined. Life is over. Their reputation is scarred. They're, that there's nothing to live for. They'll never be half but a half man or a half a woman. They'll never rise again. They'll be crippled all the rest of their days. And it wasn't your fault. You was out of control. Leah didn't want to go. She was part of the conspiracy, but it wasn't her fault. Her father forced her. Her father made her. Can you imagine how she felt? Jacob was thrilled, and she was just breaking in her heart because she knew she was a deceiver. Hello. She knew that any wonderful moments could not last any longer than morning. When the light come up and he could see what he was doing and who she was, he would be furious. He would never forgive her. He would never, she, he, he would never hear the end of it. Oh, what a predicament to be forced into, out of control, no choice, not my fault, and yet I've been a party to all this. How many is relating tonight? Can you see yourself in the mirror of the word? The sun came up. Jacob opened his eyes two or three times and rubbed them. Shook his head, couldn't believe what he was seeing. Suddenly it dawned on him like a nightmare. All this great fantasy that I have had is a fraud. It's not real. It's not what I thought it was. It's not what it's cracked up to be. Woe is me. Let me get my hands on that man, Laban. I'll tear the juggler out of my daddy-in-law. And he went out to Laban and grabbed him and shook him and come against him and said, Why have you deceived me? Why did you beguile me? You betrayed me. You undermined me. You stabbed me in the back. You double crossing four-eyed snake. Why did you do this to me? How many ever said the same thing? Mistakenly, you charged God with it foolishly. Well, it wasn't God that did it to you anyhow. It was the devil. Do not let a man say he's tempted of God. God tempts no man. You're tempted when you're drawn away to your own lust. Get drawn back toward God and you have less problems with your own lust. The presence of God will automatically drive them away. Everything negative and destructive comes from hell. Now it's true that sometimes God backs off and allows some of these things to happen, but God doesn't do them to you. He just says, angels, just step off a few steps here. And as soon as the protection backs off, the devil has a heyday. That's why you need to have a wall around you day and night and walk in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Hallelujah. Oh, stay in protectionism here tonight. Stay in the anointing. The devil can't stand it. He can't come close to it. He can't cope with it at all. Scares him, frightens him, frustrates him, confuses him. He hates blood and he hates fire. The two things that they're trying to get preachers to stop preaching. Say amen. amen. Oh, that's one of them blood and fire preachers. Well, blood and fire is the only thing that puts the devil in his place. Don't have time to preach that one. Here it was that he's confronting his father-in-law for deceiving him. And now his life is ruined. He thinks he'll never be the same again. Woe is me, I'm lost and undone. Why'd you do it, Laban? Oh, said Laban. We have a custom in this country. An awful lot of customs in this country. Are you listening to me? The reason your life's so messed up is because of customs. Rituals, traditions. Ceremonies, rigmarole, ruts, and routines. Hallelujah. Cultures, lifestyles. Praise the Lord. We have this custom, yes, and the more customs you have, the more messed up tents you're going to have. The more deceit you're going to have. The more problems you're going to have trying to cope with life that's hard enough and impossible without God. We have this custom in this country that we can't give away the younger before we give away the older daughter. I have this custom too, said Jacob. I tear the eyeballs out of people that deceive me. <laughs> Say hallelujah. Woe, 
son. Don't call me son. Just back off. Just serve me seven more years. I'll do seven more years. So just like that. Seven more years and I'll give you Rachel. Well, I have no choice, said Jacob, because she's the one I love. She's the one I was after. She's the one I wanted. She's the one I bargained for. How many is bargained for heaven in a mansion robe and crown? Ooh, he didn't get nothing. How many please it be heaven just to be next door to Jesus? Is this what you're bargaining for? Well, when those that came at the 11th hour receive a penny too, don't complain. We've all agreed for the same thing, a penny. We've all agreed for heaven. And why should we complain? Because some poor soul escaped the fires of damnation. Hallelujah. Are you listening? He said, all right, I'll serve you seven more years. And now for seven years he worked for Rachel and an interesting triangle was formed. Jacob, Leah, and Rachel. It's a generation of triangles. Hello? Are you getting my drift tonight? And yet, though everybody's life seemed to be mixed up and messed up, they all yet had desires in their spirits, in their soul. They desired things from God. I don't care how far down on Skid Row some people have felt. There are noble desires in their heart. There are some things they want to attain. They might never feel qualified nor worthy. They might feel like they'll never attain it. But the desire is still there. Let me tell you about a, the secret about desires. God will give you the desire of your heart. Is that scripture? Back up. The reason God gives you the desire of your heart is because one day long ago, he dropped the seed of desire in your heart. Plop. And because it started formulating and bursting and coming into fructivity and growing, you begin to feel that desire and pursue your desire and chase your desire and attain and seek after your desire. And you sought after it so long that finally God gave you the desire of your heart. Isn't that tricky? God knows how to get you to do it. He never does anything against your will, but he knows how to get you willing. We've covered how uh, God sent the hornets after the Canaanites. When, he, when they couldn't move the Canaanites, they moved all the ites but the Canaanites. God sent hornets after the Canaanites, and the Canaanites move. Anybody will move when the hornets are after them. And they won't be moving against their will either. But God will have gotten them willing to move. God got all kind of ways to get you willing. Now with God, it's not all carrot and no stick. Is that right? I know some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But the old farmer had a mule that wouldn't plow. He was too stubborn. And he stuck a carrot out over his head on a stick. And the mule tried to get that carrot. Took a step. Tried to get the, couldn't reach it. The stick kept it on ahead of him. The more he walked, the more the carrot dangled in front of him. And his mule brain wasn't too smart. And he just kept on chasing that carrot. In fact, all day long he walked after that carry. In fact, all day long he plowed the field. Are you listening to me? God's got ways to get you to do the job. And sometimes he even gives you a bite of the carrot. It's not all stick and no carrot with God. Sometimes he lays the stick on you. But sometimes he gives you a piece of the carrot too. He gives you the desire of your heart because he planted it there to start with. You pursued it or cut off. You attained it because he gave it to you. Desires. Let's check the desires. The desire in Leah's heart was, oh, that my husband would love me. I know he don't love me. I know I deceived him. I was part of a conspiracy. I know that it, uh, it wasn't my fault. I was forced into it, and I'm the victim of circumstances, but I've been part of his betrayal. I, he probably never loved me, and yet I want him to, and that's the desire that's in my heart. You know, there's nothing so cruel and devastating as not to be loved. Are you listening to me? And Jacob had a desire too in his heart that he was chasing. 
as a carrot on a stick. And he desired Rachel. Nothing more would do for him in his life except Rachel. And then there's Rachel. She had her desire too. She wanted children. She saw her sister have children. She was so jealous. She was so upset. She just come out to Jacob and pound on him and said, Give me children. He said, oh My God, I can't give you children. Hallelujah. Scripture said that Leah was tender eyed. Why? Because the poor girl was crying all the time. Hey, man, you start crying once in a while, your eyes will get tender. Matter of fact, your heart will get tender. Your spirit will start getting tender. And Leah was hated. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb. Isn't that interesting? You can't get your womb open until you're hated. What do you mean, brother? I'm speaking spiritually, for goodness sakes. Replace the carnal mind with the mind of Christ. I understand spiritual application here tonight that as long as the world's got their arms around you and pat you on the back and tell you how wonderful you are, you're fruitless. You are counterproductive, antiproductive, unproductive. You don't expect to do anything for God while this world loves you. Woe on you when all men speak well of you. For so did your fathers to the false prophets. Rejoice when all men, are, men speak all manner of evil falsely against you. For my name's sake, for great is your reward in heaven. If they speak evil against you and it's the truth, you suffer that. But if they speak it against you and it's false, well then you have a reward in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Someone say it's wonderful. Listen, while the world loves its own, that's of, which is of the world, it's not of the Father. It's of the world. The world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. I say to you tonight, I'll tell you you're hated by this system and by this world. You'll never have your womb open and be productive for God. That's right. You cannot love God and mammon. Love not the world or anything that's in the world. And while you're hated, that's when God has mercy on you. For if there's any part of the body that lacks and is an uncomely part, God will give a greater measure of the anointing to it so that there will be no schism in the body. Hallelujah. Is it true? So now here it stands that she is hated. So now God opens her womb. She stumbles onto this revelation. She stumbles on to the secret of how to attain the desire of her heart. And it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here with one there a little. You cannot figure it all out. But as you live this Christian walk day by day, God gives you progressive revelation, shows you more each hour. Amen. My headlights don't shine 200 feet. They only shine 100 feet. If I want to see 200 feet, I must drive 100 feet. Hello? How in the world would I plan what's going to happen here after the preaching? It's impossible. I, will, I wouldn't know what, where to start. I don't talk to people before church because I don't want nobody accusing me of talking to them. And if you know anything that you want me to know, is there anything you want me to know, don't you ever come tell me about it. I don't want you to tell me. You just mix me up and get me all messed up. I won't know what I'm doing. I know how to hear from God and that's all I care about. How many would only want it that way? Oh, hallelujah be to God. <laughs> Hated, she stumbled on to progressive revelation. She said, hey, you know, I'm having a baby. I have this strange feeling. Not just the baby kicking inside, but the fact that if I have a son, there's a possibility that my husband will start loving me and I will be getting the desire of my heart finally after all. Do you know the secret of getting the desire of your heart? Start producing. Start becoming fruitful. Start accomplishing something soul winning, life changing, getting the true vine branches and let the sap of the spirit flow through your limbs so you can produce fruit or you produce nothing and be cut off and cast into the fire. There's a way to get out of the deceit full dark tent that deceived you. There's a way to get over this mess. Storms never last. I said, there's a way to get out of the agony and the trauma and the catastrophe and the holocaust and all you've suffered. 
Start producing for God. Hallelujah. Start producing truth. Start accomplishing something for his great name's sake. She said, you know, I've just been having a pity party all these months. Feeling sorry for myself, crying the blues, tender-eyed, hated. But now that I'm hated, I, I feel like I've died inside. Ooh, dead men feel nothing. Amen. You can pound on a corpse all day, you won't know you're pounding on him. Why don't you drop dead? Why don't you die out to yourself and to your flesh and to your feelings and your embarrassments, your humiliations, and all the things that upstate you and bother your little apple cart. When you get good and hated and good and dead, you're going to feel something strange. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the Spirit of the Lord shall overshadow thee. And that holy thing that's produced in your life will be born of the anointing of God. You'll get out of this mess. You'll leave the deceit. you escape the dark tent. Oh, what a dark hour and period that was in my life, Brother Brady. Who cares? Start producing. Say hallelujah. You'll get the desire of your heart. You'll get out of this mess yet. I'll show you how Leah get out of it. Tender-eyed and hated as she was. She had a desire. She knew she was part of a conspiracy, but through no uh, help or, or purpose or reason of her own, she got mixed up, messed up, and involved in this thing. And so she brought forth this son. And she called his name Reuben. The firstborn of the twelve tribes of Israel. You believe Israel was supposed to have twelve tribes? Were they? Come to, I don't think Jacob should have been married to Leah and Rachel both. Listen, these sisters were flesh and blood. There was only the two of them. Israel had to have twelve tribes. It was impossible for Rachel to have twelve sons. Rachel died having her second son. She was too weak. Her bones was too small. She just couldn't cope with the travail. The thing, the one that Jacob so dearly loved died in childbirth, bearing Benjamin. She cried for children. She, she didn't know what she was crying for. She probably wouldn't have cried for them. But you don't know what cost it's going to take for you to attain the will of God in your life. You don't know what's going to happen to you down the road. You have great desires to do great things for God. But if some of you people knew the price that goes with operating gifts of the Spirit, you never pray for gifts of the Spirit. Amen. Your life's not your own no more. You're not going to set these things on a shelf of nine pink ribbons and say, look what I've got. You may have to get out of bed at night. You may have to travel the second mile and turn the second cheek and give away the second coat. And you may have to die daily. You, you don't know what God may have to call upon you to do and where he may send you to go or what price you will pay if you only knew what lay down the road. You'd be careful about asking for too much, too quick, too fast. Are you listening to me? The prophet came in here and said, Brother Freddy, I won't tell you everything you're going to do till you die. I said, please don't tell me. I couldn't stand it. I don't want to know. Let me live the faith. I'm liable to sit on the altar and put my thumbs and say, hey, whatever will be, will be. It's been prophesied. So I'll sit here and watch the world go by. No, we must live by faith. I said, we got to live by faith. Neither am I foolish enough to say, I don't want to know nothing. I do want to know something. If there's a word from God, I want to know. If there's a door to open, I want to know. I want to know just enough that I can handle it. Don't tell me too much, I'll forget half of it. It'd be counterproductive and pointless. It's not all knowledge. The minute you start operating revelation, some people think, well, the preacher knows everything wrong with me. It's the gift of all knowledge. It's not. It's the word of knowledge. All knowledge, all that all knowledge can do for you is blow your brains out. Your head couldn't hold all knowledge. Only God has all knowledge. Only God is God and you're still you. The gift is the word of knowledge. And a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and baskets of silver. It's just the right word to receive just enough to build your faith enough to, to, to get you over the top and over the hump till, till tomorrow, till the next time. Through shady green pastures so rich and so sweet, he leads his dear children along. Oh, are you listening? So you don't know what all the price involves. And Leah has brought four broom and she said, Oh, I rejoice for the first time since the deceit of the dark tent. Why you rejoice, Leah? Oh, <laughs> the Lord 
have seen my affliction. And now my husband will love me. I will call this son Reuben, for it means the Lord hath seen. Everybody say, the Lord hath seen. Oh, isn't this amazing? We know God sees all the time. We know God's got eyeballs. We know God can see the eyes of the Lord in every place, but it's us that don't see. We know He sees. But if you ever come to a place in God where you can see that God sees, hey, you're seeing like God sees. You're seeing like He's seeing. Oh, do you know what? If you can bring forth Reuben, you're on the first leg of deliverance out of the deceit of the dark head. You're on your way out of the deep valley. You're, out of, you're on your way out of the Holocaust. You're out of the tragedy. You're headed out. You see the light at the end of the tunnel now because you see how many wants to produce Reuben. I mean, you get a ways to go, but at least now you're seeing it like God sees it. You couldn't see it before. Why did this have to happen to me? I had such a promising career, and now look, I can't see any sense to hold it. Produce Reuben. I said, get fruitful. Start producing for God. Start bearing. Mm. Start being a profitable servant, and the first thing you produce is going to give you a vision. The scales will fall off of your eyes, and you will see like God sees, and that boy's name is called Reuben. When you get some seeing, I believe you're going to see your way out of this. Can you start seeing how God has worked in your life already? Turn back and look on it just for a moment. Never made sense for years, and now all of a sudden, hey, I begin to see the hand of God, the design of God in all this thing. You'd have never seen that if you hadn't started working for Christ and doing something for Him. They better join unto the Lord in one spirit. So let Zion travail. And when she travails, she'll bring forth sons and she'll bring forth daughters unto God. And God will add to the church daily such that she should be saved. Hallelujah! Hezekiah spread the letter from Sennacher about on the floor and said, Lord, look, look, read this letter, Lord. He's rebuking us. He is re re blaspheming in the Hebrew tongue. Not everything speaks in tongues as the Holy Ghost. Lord, read what he said. We're too weak, Lord. It's a day of reproof, rebuke, and blasphemy. The children are come to the birth, and there's not enough strength to bring them forth. Oh, God, give us strength tonight. There are souls that need to be born to the kingdom in this meeting. Oh, come on, let's produce Reuben right away so we might start seeing what God is seeing in this place. Another eye, another set of eyes. Hallelujah. A seer is one who sees. That's a deep definition. She said, oh, my husband's going to love me. Now. It was true that Jacob did not quite love her yet, but she was seeing her way clear. She was seeing her way into the realm of love and into the compatibility and the domestication of love. She knew in her bones that this was how to do it. And then she birthed another son. And as she brought forth this son, she said, Oh, the Lord have heard uh -huh. that I will take it. I'm going to call him Simeon because it means the Lord's hearing Oh, the Lord hears me. I thought God was deaf. I thought he had stoppers in his ears, but I realized I've been hearing all the time. It's me that couldn't hear nothing. Now I'm hearing that God is hearing that. Hey, I'm on my way out of this dark tent. Hallelujah. Oh, boy. The Lord have heard that I was afflicted. Now I'm going to be loved by my husband. Listen, friends, God loves you all the time, but you just don't know it. God was with you all the time, and you didn't realize it. But if you could ever start producing Reuben, you'd see it for yourself. If you could ever start producing Simeon, you'd hear it for yourself. Oh, earth, 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 hear ye the word of the Lord. Come on, have an ear to hear what the Spirit would say unto the church today. Hallelujah. I believe you're going to get out of this thing. We haven't dug a pit for your feet and set a trap for you that you can't escape from. We're showing you the solution tonight. There's a way out of this terrible thing that came into your life. There's a way out. You can see your way out and you can hear your way out. She said, I found the secret 
Oh, what a revelation. It's so precious to me. It cost me everything. But I'll never trade this secret for nothing. I'm going to have another son. And she produced Levi. And she said, now will my husband be joined unto me? Because I have borne him three sons. Levi means joined. Aren't you glad you joined up tonight? Aren't you glad you're becoming a part of this arrangement tonight? You can't possibly follow Jesus afar off and not deny him three times before the rooster cries twice. Say amen. amen. It's impossible for you to have a hands-off policy with this church and what God is doing in this town if you're in this place and involved at all because Jesus said he that's not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Why, a preacher on the fence, come down, come down from off the fence. Preach the word and take the consequence. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. She said, oh, I'm having Levi. I'm being joined. I'm being joined. How many wants to join out? Uh -huh. I didn't say you had to join this church. But I did say you have to join yourself with the plan of God with the mind of God, to the body of believers. You have to join yourself to his mind and his will. You have to join to his purpose upon the planet. You have to show up and let yourself be accounted like Joshua and his family on the Lord's side. As for me and my house, we're on the Lord's side. You want to get joined? Listen, if you never join up a room tabernacle, you better make sure that you join the church of the General Assembly of the Firstborn whose names are written in heaven unto an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of just men already made perfect. I'm talking about unified unity here tonight. Let's keep going to its purpose. You can't make progress discombobulated and disassociated and cut off and split and divided. You gotta get joined, Levi. Hey, you wanna get out of the awful thing that happened in your life? not so awful anymore is it because you're being joined to God's plan to God's power to God's solution to God's deliverance to God's rescuing you're being joined she said I've learned a mighty secret I'm going to have me another son and she birthed Judah she said oh my now will I praise the Lord funny Leah you ought to have been praising the Lord all the time you should have been praising God from the start. Well, there's nothing to praise God for. Well, praise Him anyhow. But my wife backed into a telephone pole. Color went out of my sand. I really praise God for that. Hallelujah. Awful things are happening. Well, so I praise the Lord. In the, anyhow, the Bible said in everything, give thanks. Not just the good things, in everything. Hello. Now will I praise the Lord. I've been praising God all the time. Listen, can you praise God for all the horrible things that's ever happened to you? Can you do it now? You couldn't do it before. How come you can do it now? Because you started to see why. You begin to hear why. You got joined up to God's program and plan regardless of how life dealt you a nasty blow. Now you can praise God for it. And as soon as she started praising the Lord, she left bearing. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it time for you to stop bearing that load? Isn't it time for you to lay the burden down? And get this chip off in your shoulder and this load off in your back? Why would you carry your care? Cast all your care on Him, for He cares for you. You're yoked, remember? If you start praising God, I promise you that Judah will be born. Judah means praise. How many knows Judah means praise? She said, now I'm going to praise the Lord. His name is Judah, and I'm going to leave Mary. And sure enough, she had a long rest. She didn't have to bear for a long period of years. I'd say it's time to enter into the rest that belongs to the people of God. Enter into revival here tonight, if you please. Hmm? Praise the Lord and lay the burden down. And when you go home, leave it where you left it. Don't drag it off the altar and drag it home with you. Are oh, you listening? Tie it with cords to the altar. That's what the cords are for. 
And as far as the fire is concerned, that's to offer the sacrifice to the Lord. So while you're feeling the fire, remember the next step is sacrifice. God will not be able to get your sacrifice or receive your sacrifice if there's not a little fire in it. And if all you've got is fire no sacrifice, it's still not doing you no good. Hello. Who's got the Holy Ghost? who got the Holy Ghost and fire? Who's got the Holy Ghost and fire and sacrifice to go with it? <laughs> Wave your hand in victory. She left there. How many fears your load falling off right now? Quickly. In the conclusion here tonight, after some period of rest, Scripture said she bore her fifth son. During the resting period, Bilhah, her handmaiden, bore sons to Jacob to complete the twelve tribes of Israel because Israel had to have twelve tribes. And the apostles had to be twelve. Or else how could the New Jerusalem have twelve gates, which are the twelve tribes of Israel, and twelve foundations, which are the twelve apostles of the Lamb? The twelve but twelve, four and twenty elders. Are you listening? What a square city it is. Four square. Are you listening to me? It had to be. Rachel could not accomplish it all. And God has worked in your life in such a way that you wouldn't have planned, but you have accomplished in the end what you started off not knowing how to do. Thanks be to his unspeakable gift. You were out of control. Your hands were tied. You're helplessly a bystander watching it happen. God took over in a way that you would never have done yourself. And now that it's all come out in the wash, you see God knew best. Father knows best. It's a curse. What's the fifth son? Oh, she said, the Lord hath given me my hire. I'll give my maidservant to my husband. I didn't want to do it, but 12 tribes had to be in his room. God's will be done. Lo and behold, for my sacrifice, for doing what I didn't even want to do, God has given me my hire. He's about to hire some of you and pay you too. He's about right now to give you your reward for your efforts made here tonight. Not just for the years you live for God, but for the minutes you spent in this service tonight, letting your faith and your strength and your attention and your worship and your patience and your endurance. Some of you have endured the word, but some of you knew how to enjoy the word. That's even better. Hallelujah. God won't be in debt to you. He's going to hire you out and pay you right up on the spot the same night. And when the children of Israel hired people, they paid them at the end of the day. Not the end of the week, not the end of the month. When the laboring man works, at the end of the day, he received his wages. At the end of this meeting tonight, God is going to reward you and give you your hire. Issachar is going to be born. Hey, you're going to get out of this thing yet. I think you're going to get out of it. You're about to be rewarded. You're about to have your need met, your miracle wrought. Oh, God thought it, grace brought it, and Christ bought it, Saint fought it, Paul sought it, and I caught it. I said, your hire is about to be passed out. He's going to reward you. Oh, there's one more son. Hey, six is the number of the earth. Is that right? Six days he made all things, and the seventh day he rested. Get ready for rest. There's one more hurdle to climb. And that's Zebulun starts at Z. From A to Z, it will be accomplished. Alpha and Omega. <laughs> Zebulun, one more son. Oh, this will do it. I'll finally have the desire of my heart. I'll have my husband's love. Jacob said, I'll finally have the desire of my heart. I'll serve the 14th year for Rachel. Rachel said, I'll finally have the desire of my heart. I'll have children too. Oh, as life goes on, people seeking the desires of their heart. God is here to meet them tonight. It's only going to take one more son to do it. How many wants to be fruitful and productive? Accomplishing for God. Zebulun is birth. Oh, said Leah, now will my husband dwell with me, for I have borne him the six. Oh, my God. Don't you want your husband to dwell with you tonight? I said, I want him to dwell with me. He's the bridegroom. We're the bride. 
He's the head of this church. He's the heir of all things. I want him to live and dwell in here. I'm going to have him take up a residence in your bosom, in your spirit. Does he live in your heart? Does he dwell with you? One thing I desire of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, you know, that's just the first half of the story when he comes to dwell with you. I said, when your husband dwells with you, that's only the first part. But that's the important part. Because if you invite him and he condescends to dwell with you, there is coming an hour when you will go to dwell with him. There waits for me a glad tomorrow. Where gates and pearls swing open wide. When I pass the spells call, I'll camp upon the other side. Someday beyond the reach of more kin. Someday God only knows just where and when. The wheels of mortal life shall all stand still. And I shall go to dwell. To dwell on Zion's hill. <laughs> My father's house has many mansions. The one so I would have told you. But it told you that it must be so I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also that I go away to prepare a place for you. I will doubtless come again and receive you unto myself that where I am ye may be also. I'm dwelling with you tonight, but tomorrow night you may be dwelling with me. Hallelujah! Zebulon, that's the end of the matter. Heaven's my final home, lodging place, and resting spot. I don't care what you've been through, you're almost out of it. Zebulon is coming forth in your life. And when he does, he's going to dwell in your heart. He's going to dwell in your life. He's going to dwell in your house and in your home. And because he does, you're going to dwell with him too. It's a matter of time. Hallelujah. Just a matter of time, and you're going to dwell with him. Right now, he's going to dwell with you. How many wants the desire of your heart tonight? I'm all through preaching. Supper's already been served, and it's off the table now. If you didn't eat while it was hot, that's tough luck. It's the bed or the woodshed, but you won't be fed. We don't hash, rehash an old hash around here. I hope you ate while you had a chance. Because now we're praying the prayer of faith, and if you have not received the word, you may not receive the desire of your heart. But if you have understood the preaching tonight, and you want Jesus to dwell with you in your soul, it's basic criteria. You can't dwell with him till he first dwells with you. How many been through an awful time at some point in your life? Have you been encouraged tonight by God's word? You're seeing your way out of it. You're hearing your way out of it. You're joining your way out of it. You're praising your way out of it. You're being rewarded on your way out of it. And now you're going to dwell your way out of it because he's with you. And someday you'll be with him. Well, no matter now. It's all over now. Just something to testify about and shout about on the hills of glory. How you overcome. We'll tell the story how we overcome. And we'll understand it better by and by. At least there's a by and by to understand it in now. How many got better understanding? I'm praying for souls. Every soul in the place that wants the Lord to dwell with you so that you can dwell with him. Would you stand for my first prayer? I'm praying for soul. You want him to dwell with you? Rise to your feet and let him dwell with you so that you may have permission to dwell with him when that hour comes. All you souls, lift your hands above your head while we pray. Oh, Jesus, they've been through a lot. It's been a hard and difficult life. So many troubles. In that night of the dark tent, they were so deceived. They never thought they'd get it all together ever again. But tonight, you're opening their eyes. Here comes Reuben. You're opening their ears. Here comes Simeon. They're joining up 
to your clan, to your spirit, to your church. Here comes Levi. Oh, they're halfway there already. Oh, get your hands up, you're halfway there already. Hallelujah. Oh, they're praising you. Here comes Judah. Only to reward me to shower down around our ears and down around our head under the smoke where the glory comes out. The blessing of God make a break out of those thoughts being poured out without measure on me now. Here comes this a come. Here's this a come. Oh, my higher. The Lord has rewarded me. Look out. Here comes Zebulun. He's in my heart. The Lord's dwelling with me. Open your heart and let Jesus in. Oh, Lord. He'll remove your burden from sin. Jesus wants to be. Your dearest, sweetest friend. Won't you open your heart now and let him dwell in. Here comes Zebulun. He's dwelling with you. Take his hand. Take his face, hand, with Jesus, we'll show you the way. He may not pass, he may not pass, you will get you back. Come upon me, I will no lies cast down. Oh, glory to God. Invite him. Here he comes. He's dwelling. Because he dwells with you, he has to return the invitation to let you dwell with him. Thank God that Zebulun has been birthed in your life tonight. Thank God for Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. You finally see your way out of this mess. You finally escape the damnation of hell. You finally been delivered from the deceitfulness of the dark pit in your life. Everyone says, thank God it's working all to have Jesus well in your name. Thank God for every soul. Why you can take his hand right now. over our soul. It's fighting against the whole wide world. Oh, well. Thank God. Thank God. I'd say the first prayer of faith was a success. I always judge the message of the hour by its results. I see by the crowd who stood it was the message of the hour. By the souls that have been reached, God hath done his work well. Whenever the Word of God is allowed to be confirmed, it will be demonstrated mightily. There cannot be a wimp and shut the book and say, let's dismiss and go home, dearies. Nothing to whimper about, it's either real or let's forget it. It either works or let's go find something else. The first night it doesn't work, I'm through, but every night it gets more real and more real. No way to get through. You can never finish this ministry. Just gets more real as the moments go by. You think God heard the first prayer? Did He? How do you know? What you feel in your soul? We give two altar calls every night. The first one's by invitation. That's this one. The second one is by ear. We can go and get them by the ear. Glad you can long peacefully on the first one tonight. I'd like to ask this question for the sake of those in the audience who do not know it yet. 
and who do not quite know what to expect in their own lives from this point onward. So the whole congregation study this show of hands. How many are here tonight that's ever been prayed for in our meetings or in our ministry before? If we've ever prayed for you before, hold your hand up if you're here tonight. Hold your hand high if we've ever prayed for you. Don't drop it. Keep it up. Everybody look around, see the hands that are up. Is that a few folks been prayed for? These are folks that's been prayed for on the individual basis, one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to pray some one-on-one -on -one tonight and then some mass miracles, but right now it's one-on-one. -on -one. Don't drop your hand yet, but here's the second question. How many received something the night you prayed for? You received something. God give you a miracle, did something definitely for you. Don't drop your hand yet, unless you have to. Here's the last question. This will really be the kicker. How many of you still got it? I'm looking for hands to get out, and I'm on my tiptoes. I haven't seen any drop yet that was in front of my sight. What are we saying here? This is incredible. To what do we attribute the permanency of these miracles? To the fact that we preach the Word of God. That is what we attribute it to. Did you hear the Word of God preached tonight? Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, you can conclude that when the miracle hits you tonight, it too will be permanent for years and years and years because the Word of God was preached. One more time, let's see the hands of those who still got it. If you've still got it, <laughs> go ahead and rejoice. I only did that to let the people know what to expect in their own life and to show you that you can have faith for a miracle that will stick to your fifth ribs like Quaker's Oats. It's going to last. A permanent work until Jesus comes. Aren't you glad? Wave your hand in victory. Oh, go ahead. I love him. It's Friday night. Let's just conclude this service with a great big thick layer of frosting on the cake. Let God confirm His Word. Why would you work all week long and forget to pick up your check? Nobody's that foolish. No, when I go home about my miracle after I've been in a powerful meeting and I've worked all through this meeting like you have, and go home about my miracle, it's just absurd. Hallelujah. We're going to let you remain standing for a couple of prayers. After that, you may be seated, but not yet. I want to make sure you're standing with the preacher. You that want to be in, found in good standing with the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. This little sister right here in the aisle, step out. Let's pray for you first off tonight. Do you believe that the Lord will heal your body? Yes. Raise both your hands to God. Everyone said, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Look upon me. The first thing that God's doing for you is touching you in your chest, in your breathing in your lungs, there is a bronchial tickle that lingers down in your chest. You'd like to get rid of that? Yes. Your eyes are getting big. Whoa. <laughs> it's, it's very, very true. Well, no wonder your eyes are getting big. <laughs> We're going to have fun tonight, Brother Tony. Whoa, boy. I enjoy this portion. Now the Lord is touching you in your lungs, your bronchial condition is going to leave after all this time. Hallelujah. Joe, do you know Joe? Yeah. Who's Joe? He's right there next to me. Get out here, Joe. Hallelujah. God's touched you before. Yes. Yes. And there are people that pray for you all the time. Yes. Here's one of them right here. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. Revelation's progressive. You don't panic and get in a, in a rush. You just move in the flow. God wants you to know. He'll tell you in his own time. Say hallelujah. Thank God. Keep your hands up. Praising the Lord. The Lord laid this brother on your heart to, to be praying for him. Is that right? Yeah. You have a burden for him. 
Yes. And you're to continue praying for him too. God is going to give you other people to pray for. By faith and by name, they will come before you as you kneel in prayer in your private times. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'd say this thing will be contagious. It'll happen to you too. Yes. I mean, if by revelation, the sister's praying for you, you're going to pray for other people the same way if you will be faithful in your prayer. Amen. God healed you last night, didn't he? Amen. What did he heal you of? A few things. A couple things. But you did get healed. Amen. Name one of them. I lost. And it left you. Amen. Well, we took off. This thing's getting heavy here. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes. Joanne. You know Joanne? Yes. Joanne. Next thing. Things are working on this here. Well, I guess you've got your first person to pray for. Amen. What do you think of that? Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah to God. Listen, you have been troubled in your lower abdomen here, in your lower stomach, even to the female area. God is going to restore this for you tonight. Hallelujah. You glad? Amen. The suffering that you get here, you'll get it no more. You have something in your lower back that feels like a straight jacket. It's gone. There goes the straight jacket. Hallelujah. Your block, the block is at the sinus level, at the nasal. You want that open too, I suppose? I've had headaches for three years from that. We're turning into a hoggish congregation. She's getting hoggish. That means she wants more and more. And that's all right, because if you don't want it, you won't get it. Loosen your head up to keep a bowl shine. Woo, glory to God. Thank my God. Glory to God. You've had just a little bit of an oil factor that has affected your skin. Affecting your skin. Kind of breaks out of your skin as a, like an oily substance. That will neutralize and become normal. Everyone said, thank God. Thank God. Surgery success. Breathe deep and see where the bronco went to.